thanks a lot. We move on now to the uh, discussion in the panel. So I would like to ask and to invite the four panel members to put their mic and camera on so that we can move on. Um, okay, so we are, okay, we are there. So first of all, um, I will immediately start with some questions. And the first question is certainly what drives, for instance, these pulp and paper companies to exit from their comfort zone, although I think that paper is not a comfort zone uh, anymore, and to take the risk to move uh, to a whole biorefinery. It was very clearly shown by Michael, where he showed really that every piece of a of, a, of a, uh, a tree is used really. Um, and um, so to move to this uh, biorefinery and not just delivering pulp and paper, but a whole um, uh, range of different uh, products. Maybe the same for Braskem, what drives you to move from a fossil based company to a more and more bio based uh, uh, producer. And then finally to the brand owner. Julia, what drives your company to move towards these more sustainable products? You made so strong uh, pledges and commitments. What is the driver? Uh, maybe to um, make this panel discussion easy, it, it is best that you just visibly raise your hand so then uh, we can uh, move on in a smooth uh, way and we don't speak together. Who wants to start uh, by giving it? first idea on yeah michael should i start because you you started with pulp, pulp and paper industries so. exactly um you're right i mean the printing paper market is not any more uh, comfort zone i mean it's shrinking market uh, but we are very successful there and of course we focus also to use emissions for example in our paper production mm -hmm. and use less water and we there we have also company target to increase the sustainability there um, when we enter into other areas uh, like biofuels, biochemicals, partly we exit our comfort zone, but we also use our capabilities and competence in forestry management, in sourcing of sustainably wood and converting wood into to something else. I mean, that is the same. And the first steps of our process are not so far away from pulping processes. So from the technology point of view, it's not really far away, but entering new markets, of course, you need uh, you need other different capabilities, competencies. Uh, we feel that with our knowledge, we can contribute largely to make value chains more sustainable. And we are partnering with customers and users um, to help them to become more sustainable. The knowledge of handling 27 million cubic meters of wood as one example that's quite i mean that's um the um, that's a history or well, we can do it because of the history and i know that chemical industry for example is quite has a lot of respect for this so we are using our competence and add other competences to it so it's not so far away and i think it's important it's our dedication also to help others to become more sustainable and let's join the forces I think um, joining the forces is quite uh, interesting because you are moving on the way to make more chemicals. The chemical industry is looking to have or to produce more uh, bio-based um, or to use more bio uh, feedstock. So in that way, uh, joining our forces uh, can become uh, very uh, interesting. And maybe um, I can move immediately to Martin. Uh, how do you see this, um, this new marriage, if you want, between the, the bio uh, companies and the chemical companies because I have the feeling that your company is really uh, doing this a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And uh, we're going to do more. That's uh, that's for sure. We, uh, also, my colleagues here already are supplying also to chemical industries to make plastics. So uh, this whole concept of, of a biorefinery for um, companies that traditionally were using a bio-based feedstock to produce only one product is is happening also in brazil with sugarcane so sugarcane was first applied to make just sugar then they moved on with ethanol then they learned how to co-generate from the bagasse and then they're uh the they're 
doing the recycling inside their process as well. Uh, some are moving from what we call Ferte irrigation, where you just take the venas that is the leftover from the distillery and apply to the field to make uh, biogas as a biofuel and then uh, compost. So it's really moving fast. It's very exciting to see these things happening. And the next step uh, that's happening here in Europe is, is um, the, the, the NAFTA crackers starting more and more to use uh, biofeedstock and, and futurely also chemically recycled feedstock. So that's, uh, that's for sure going to happen. We're, we're just uh, uh, going to see more and more use of bio-based feedstock by the petrochemical industry. Thanks, Martin. Josef, do you see, is your company also seeing this as a evolutionary process uh, where you move from one to the other? in, in, in uh, making use of your skills of the past and moving then on to, to make more out of, of a tree and to make it more sustainable? Is it the same way? Yeah, it's, it's quite similar. As, as already discussed before, we, we try, of course, to improve the material use share of, of, of the wood. Um, so this, this is, let's say, from, from our bio refinery side, from the pulping side. Uh, but also from the fiber side, from the fiber processes we have here, uh, have there. So we also try to let's say broaden the, the application of our processes we have because uh, up to now we have been a staple fiber producer, and and with, with the Lyocell technology, we now try to branch out to use this really as a technology platform to deliver different products uh, like a filament, like a like a melt long fleece. So we also try to one end of the bio refinery, let's say really on on the trunk of, of the tree. Uh, but also for the branches of the final product we have. So also to deliver products like the filament and the dye clip on web, which can skip uh, steps in the production chain and thus making the, the, the whole production, the whole uh, value chain more sustainable. So this is, yeah, I think this is kind of evolution. And as it was mentioned before, we, we also build on, on the strengths we have, on the knowledge we have and, and transfer this to new areas. But the fact that this evolution takes place now is not just as a result of the evolution, it's it's a result also of different drivers. Yeah, of course, of course. I think I think Lansing. Um, I think we've always been been strong in this uh, sustainability topic. Uh, we have been the first uh, fiber producer with an LCA. Uh, we have been the first fiber producer invited to join the Sustainable Repair Coalition. Uh, now we have been the first uh, fiber company to have science-based targets, uh, but. As we say, just during the last few years, this has really become important and really becoming the, perhaps the most important selling argument for our fibers, also for the customers, because the, the, the end consumers also demand these products. And as I said before, they demand also this transparency. So that they want to prove that the product you're selling is, is really green and sustainable. And, and, and we have been long active in this field and we can prove this with all the, the instruments to show this. And I think this, uh, let's say now we can some way how has popular already started in, in the past. Yep. But of course there's, there's a long trend going on like also with this Fridays for Futures and, and you name it. So this is really a new trend. Let's move on now to uh, Unilever, which is a brand owner. I think Julia, you are much more uh, tightly bound to the consumers. Um, the former panel men members, they are linked to a tree or to sugarcane in a certain way, but you are, looked, you are linked not to these um, biomasses uh, per definition, you are linked to the consumer who is critical and, to, and is looking for um, sustainable materials, sustainable products, etc. How is your company um, working in that field? Yes, Ludo. So, so the, the drive to develop more sustainable products um, is really very much embedded in the Unilever purpose. So I think I talked about this, you know, starting from the founding of, of uh, Lord William uh, Lever and the founding of the company with our purpose of making sustainable living commonplace. It's very much embedded into the heart of what we do. And, um, you know, our research over the years shows that it actually leads to better superior business performance. So if you take the last study that was done of this in 2018, 
our sustainable living brands, which are the 28 brands that we have identified have embedded purpose into their heart, um, are both growing faster than the rest of the business. They grew 69% faster than the rest of the business, up from 46% in 2017. So their, their rate of growth is accelerating and they deliver 75% of the overall growth. So, you know, what that tells us is that, um, you know, consumers are looking for products that are uh, sustainable, that help them live more sustainable and healthier lives. Um, and so our ambition is to help more of our brands develop a sustainable living purpose that, that speaks to the core elements of making sustainable living commonplace. Maybe uh, another point is you're also committed to implement more traceability of your raw materials and your um, deforestation um, uh, pledge in three years, um, which is an associated uh, with, uh, with a lot of different uh, things. And um, what is really the, the, the progress so far concerning this traceability? Um, I think it's, it's really not easy to, to make that. And um, we see it not only uh, needed nowadays in, um, in bio-based, but also in other materials, this traceability is becoming so important. In the food business, it is already a little bit developed. So how, what is the approach that Unilever is uh, taking in this? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think the, the argument of traceability and transparency is, is at the heart of what we are talking about today, because a sustainable uh, bio-based economy is one where we are able to preserve natural habitats and where we are able to produce um, um, biomaterials as feedstocks, as fuel, as, as food products, etc., in a sustainable way for generations to come. So in order to get there, if our commodity supply chains are linked to driving greater habitat conversion, such as deforestation, um, then, then we're not relying on a sustainable uh, source of material for the long term. Um, so what we have been doing over the course of the last, well, the last decade that we are working on no ending deforestation in our supply chain, um, but especially in the last year, I would say there's been a big acceleration behind how we are using digital to drive greater transparency of our origins. And ultimately, the reason we need this transparency is that if, if as a company we wish to end Defor the connection between our commodity supply chains, be it pulp or paper or palm oil especially, um, or soy, etc., with the conversion of natural habitats, then we need to understand where are those materials coming from, what impact are they having on the planet, is there deforestation in that particular place, and if so, what are the partnerships, the relationships that we need on the ground, be it with our suppliers or with government, NGOs, et cetera, to, in order to ensure that it stops. Um, and if you think about what it really takes to end deforestation in a supply chain, it's not just understanding where the forest is, but it's also being able to understand where is, for example, the commodity. Now to a, a question that was asked earlier on, you know, is therefore, does it mean that forest products are out? <laughs> Naturally, no. Sustainable forestry is a tremendous lever in terms of uh, whether it is helping to advance Unilever's um, um, biogenic sourcing strategy, meaning like our conversion to renewable energy for our operations or whether it is for our sustainable packaging agenda, et cetera, um, you know, sustainably managed forests are important. But distinguishing between a natural forest and a planted forest is actually not so easy, even from satellite images. So this is why we are working with a variety of tech partners to really come together and develop the tools that are needed to bring that greater degree of transparency. So just to conclude and give a picture of some of the partnerships that we've been working on, we have partnered with Google Cloud to become the first commercial users of the Google Earth Engine. Um, and that essentially acts as our command center for geospatial data. Um, we are working with a, a, a really innovative um, um, startup called Lab to better understand where, where the palm is planted. This is specifically for Southeast Asia and our palm oil sourcing. Where are the forests and how to better fine tune deforestation alerts so we can make them more actionable. And then we're working with a company called Orbital Insight, which is another innovative startup, to use geolocation to bring better traceability or better transparency, I would say, to origin. So helping us use geolocation data captured from cell phones uh, as a way to link our sourcing to, to the origins. 
So a nice introduction as well also to the digital use and uh, satellite uses, etc. Thanks, uh, Julia. And I, I would like now to turn from this point back to the, the four members of the panel. I think I am a biotechnologist, so I'm convinced that uh, biomass and biotechnology are an enormous way to, to move our world towards uh, sustainability. And I think the two uh, colleagues in the studio of the World Bioeconomy Forum as well. But how can we convince um, the consumers, the citizens, th that bio is better than fossil based? They have a feeling sometimes fossil based is not good, but it's not automatically that they think that um, bio based will be better because then we enter in um, exactly what Julio was telling that uh, we don't want to interact with um, biodiversity issues, etc. How are you looking to it as a company and how can you convince consumers that um, really um, the sustainable uh, use of forests, the sustainable use of agriculture can be the solution towards a more sustainable world? Who wants to interact first? Not all together. I think it's very important to, to have fact-based um, communication, right? I mean, to be very honest, fact-based and uh, implement transparency in communicating our targets and the achievement level of our targets, for example, to reduce emissions, uh, to reduce water offtake and so on. Uh, this needs to be done by, by facts transparent um, and then of course it's also about um, being part of the circular economy or I would call it circular bioeconomy right I mean of course we need to target uh, recyclable materials like paper is for example or our MEG will end up most likely in PET. PET is one of the plastics which can be recycled mechanically and in the future maybe more and more chemically as well and then the losses in the recycling you make up with this sustainable monomer sustainable materials and i think that's then the perfect circular economy sustainable circular economy and you need again and again uh, tell this uh, the story which is fact-based and uh, live by examples and be yourself a rule model and an example an almost important point i think uh, michael maybe martin you showed the the two cycles the technical and the bio cycle and maybe this separation is not so good and indeed we need to to go from the one cycle to feed the 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 other one is, is can that be part of the um, communication to the to the consumers well when it comes to communicating with consumers i i find it very challenging i don't think it's easy to do that so the industry is trying to come up with easier ways to communicate like plant bottle or something like that yeah. uh, so I, I'm sure uh, Julia can can talk better than myself about it um, but yeah I, I, I think um, being 10 years uh, tr marketing the the green PE we have learned a bit about how how to to do it and uh, having some uh, important fact-based and science-based figures like the carbon footprint. Uh, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, Unilever will start showing the carbon footprint of their products. I think I read it somewhere, but anyhow, I think maybe with that, it will add to the product value proposition, right? It will help reduce the carbon footprint of the whole thing that's being sold, which is not just the packaging because Green Pea goes a lot to packaging and the, the packaging is part of something bigger, which is the product. So. Yeah, it's it's challenging, and um, I think maybe Julia can comment a bit more, if, uh, although she's not marketing. But <laughs> is this uh, footprint mentioning on on your products uh, becoming an important issue, Josef and Julia? Um, I, I guess I'll just uh, briefly jump in. So as I mentioned, you know, in our commitment to climate and nature this year, uh, in June of this year, we, we um, indicated that we have the ambition to communicate the carbon footprint of all of the products that we produce. But at the same time, we also realize that the data to do that is not yet necessarily out there. So let's just say it's the beginning of a long journey. 
to build the transparency that is needed uh, from a CO2 standpoint. So be it, you know, life cycle assessments or um, um, specific greenhouse gas footprint for materials from suppliers as opposed to using generic industry averages. So this is all, this is all to be, uh, you know, new ground that, that we, need to, we need to break through and, and paths that need to be forged in order to get there. Um, I, but, you know, I think the, the experience of the sustainable living brand um, journey shows that if you do communicate sustainability in an authentic way to the consumer, it does drive business growth. Now, whether that is a label, a number, or something more is, is you know, probably something that has to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't think that there is any specific rule that I know of that, that says this is how you, how you do it. Um, but rather it is a journey that a brand or a branded goods company needs to go on to find what is the, what is the resonating and authentic way to do that. Thanks a lot, uh, Josef. Before we go to the studio for questions from the audience, do you have to add something to this? Yeah, as I think it was already mentioned, you, you need this, to have these things fact-based, science-based, uh, because then, then you get credibility. Uh, but, but there are some methods, but some methods are still missing. Uh, I can say, like for the Renewable Carbon Initiative, there's no discussion. Uh, can we have some kind of meta label to show how many renewable carbon is in the product? So it, it's still an ongoing discussion to find the right label, to, to, to find the right way to tell it to, to, to the consumers. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's one of the important things to really to tell it to the consumer and in a way that they understand it. So I think this is really science-based. You, you have to have in the background, but you cannot give a consumer and they'll say, so here this is it, you have to break it down and you have to tell them what you're doing. And I think this is important. And I think this also reflects the, the, the title of, of this round table bio products around us. Uh, because many people don't know what's already a bioproduct is. They think, oh, this, this is something in the future, and, and perhaps in, in 2050 there will be a bioeconomy, but, but bioeconomics is existing, take UPM, take Lansing. So, and you have also to make people aware of that, because when, when you talk to them like this, they say, oh, 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 this is really bio based. I, I did not know. And, and they then have a starting point. I think this is also important to tell what we're doing and, and also what we're planning. To. Oh, I think we should brand it even better to that it is um, even more clear and we know that the scientific based is also not an easy message of course. I already would like to thank you for the first time but it's not finished. I would like to hand over now uh, back to uh, Mark and Yuka for some questions from uh, the audience. Hi there, excellent. What an excellent panel. Thank you very much. Well done. Really, really good. Very good indeed. Um, we do have some questions from the audience. Uh, Julia, you had one earlier on, but your presentation was so uh, covering everything that uh, you answered it while you did your presentation. So <laughs> that was good. Um, so a question for Joseph from the audience. Uh, would other um, sources of cellulose like wheat straw, oil, palm empty fruit, bunch or sugarcane straw work for lensings technology to produce fibers for the textile industry? Okay, that's, that's quite a good question. Uh, thank you for that. So I think our, our main source is, is still wood. And when talking about uh, alternative renewable uh, cellular sources, as we call it internally, so the focus at the moment is for recycling as a uh, other sustainable cellular source. But of course, we're also looking into straw, other materials. Algae is, is also a hot topic at the moment. Uh, but the problem or the challenge here is that at the moment uh, the availability of, the, of, of these raw materials is quite quite limited and also that the, the quality is fluctuating. So to really run this in, in, in a full scale industrial production is really challenging. Uh, and uh, an OPPO, even if you say, okay, sport is great uh, sustainable material, you really have to look closer because we really did some uh, studies, some trials looking into this and uh, it's not always that it's more sustainable than wood when you really do an LC and looking into this because you have the transport, you have the storage. Of course, uh, the wood process, this has been established for decades and other things are coming up and we have now a, let's say, a little, slight different approach uh, that with, with, with such new raw materials we don't have already for a full industrial production with 100,000 tons per year, but we say, okay, let's 
test it perhaps at, at, at our pilot plant uh, and then have a, a smaller collection so just to show if it works and, and then perhaps with partners we can move on and, and expand this. So we are looking into this uh, but for yellow sources besides what at the moment the clear focus is recycling but we're not neglecting the other stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ludo, any comments on that or anybody else any comments? Not from my side. No? All good. Great. Good answer. Um, and then a question from New York City for Martin. Um, there was a news report that Braskem is planning to expand its green PE production capacity. Can you confirm this, if this is true? And if so, by how much and when is the expansion going to take place? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, Braskem is listed in the stock market, so we're not able to mention anything that is not already approved by the board. But if you see how demand the market is, uh, of course, we're looking into mm. uh, ways to expand. But I cannot further uh, d give details on that. Okay, excellent. Maybe from my side, is there something ongoing, as you know, every, somewhere on uh, poly, on propylene, bio, on green propylene? Or it's been ongoing for 10 years, Ludo. Uh, it's very challenging to make it uh, in a competitive way to compete with I, I mean, we already gave up being competitive with fossil plastic, but even in a reasonable premium, it's it's really hard. Uh, but it we didn't give up. We we continue in the lab looking to clever ways to make biobased PP. Nice, Mark. Yeah, we have a question uh, for Michael and Joseph. And um, how is the distribution in percentage of use of industrial wood? wood residues, wood byproducts, etc. And also, do you use recycling, recycled wood? Should I start? Uh, we mentioned that we will either use, and not either, we will use both industrial pulp wood from sustainable managed resources, as well as sawdust from hardwood sawmills. We cannot say now, and we will not disclose the share of each of, of those, but what, of course we are developing our process to become more and more robust to use also other wood species, not only beach and like in the beginning and maybe recycled wood in the future. But we are now at the first of its kind facility. We want to limit somehow the, the degree of freedom uh, on, on that side. So we are really focusing on the sawdust as well as industrial pulp wood. Yeah, okay, so also from my side, I even don't know the exact numbers, uh, but what I can say, what, what, what we're using as, as a raw material, it's not, let's say, just this high quality wood, which you can also use for furniture or for construction. Uh, so we all, uh, so I don't know the proper word, but you, you have to clean a forest to get uh, the smaller trees out so that the rest can grow. So that's a lot of the wood we are using here in Lansing. Uh, then on uh, our Pascal side, I also now we are using residuals from, from a close by uh, wood factory, so, so we have different sources. And uh, yeah, as, as just said, uh, Michael, um, we also we are using mostly beech wood in Lansing, but we also try to expand the portfolio. And what we're using there is also a lot of, of wood uh, from, from storms uh, and, and other uh, weather incidents that we can use this and can take this out from the market because there's also not. It cannot be used for many other applications. Of course, it can be burned, but if you can use it for pulp paper and, and onboard fibers, I think it's the, the higher value application. So we also put quite some effort that we can broaden our wood basket and, and use this wood on a regular basis. Okay, any other comments? Yeah. Um, we have a qu another question for Michael here, and that is how price competitive is UPM's wood-based glycols compared to India glycol sugarcane-based biomeg and traditional petro-based meg. I waited for this question. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we will not uh, talk about our cost internal cost structure. Um, from the performance, we are we are exactly the same like the fossil-based MEG, so there's no difference. The, on the other end, it's a different product because our carbon footprint is much less. So the um, rucksack of CO2 emissions is much lower, and then the question is, uh, what is what is the value we provide provide to our customers, right, to to help them to achieve their goals? 
And yes, starting point is, of course, I mean, there's market price for fossil-based MEG. There's no market price for bio-based MEG. And let's see what the value is for this uh, lower C2 footprint. Okay. Excellent. Any comments? Any further comments there? Mm -hmm. And then question uh, for Martin again. Um, how much material loss do you have when recycling and how much energy is used for the recycling process compared to the new production of bioplastics? I didn't quite get the question. Could you repeat that, please? Yeah, yeah. How much material loss do you have when recycling and how much energy is used for the recycling process compared to the new production of bioplastics? That question doesn't sound very right to me I, I, because it's not a recycling process. We're making plastics from a bio-based source instead of a fossil source. Okay. And the energy requirements are more or less the same, mm -hmm. but the energy matrix is cleaner, let's say, to make the biobase. It's more renewable, not cleaner, but more renewable. So that helps on the, the carbon footprint. But when you talk about recycling, then uh, it's just as recyclable as a regular piece. So mm -hmm. the energy requirements are the same. Well, I can, if I can come in, I think indeed it's uh, your green or bioethylene uh, or polyethylene is coming in the same cycle as the fossil-based uh, polyethylene exactly. and at the end will be recycled in, in, a, in the same way, in a mixed way. That's and correct. more you put uh, bio-PE in, uh, in the system, the, the more your recycled um, PE will become uh, bio-based. So that uh, can, can move on in function of time without in fact any problem and without any discussion about availability because we just add it in function that it is available and slowly replace fossil based if okay. we focus on recycling that's exactly what that chart was trying to depict perfect for sure maybe maybe i com can comment or maybe a question that okay to, to martin that okay to, in a way that okay that can we then say that okay that your way of the okay doing this that, okay the buyer based uh, chemicals and okay the plastic is that okay you have a sort of drop in solution that okay that you are replacing the phosphide based and that okay parcel you are using the same part of value chain that you are already having with the fossil based that okay the production lines that okay the, but is there also okay parallel to that can you think about then okay totally something else that you could then convert it out of the bio based feedstocks uh you mean to change the feedstock to i didn't get again I, the question sir. i i mean that okay that going for the materials plastic is one type of material and now it is a very massive okay the okay the fossil based it took the feedstock is then the one that how it is then the, the, the cultivated and that okay partially it is so that now that okay to get in that the green is that okay to having the bio based feedstock and you are using the same part of the, the value chain what you are using the fossil based can you think about that okay the material like plastics to be then that okay the, uh, let's say the cultivated the, totally with the new value chains out of the biomass would that be any focus in your development work you're, you're have to tell that, but, uh, okay. I'm curious on that hmm. uh if you're saying if you're asking about expanding the application of biomass within Braskem to other applications? Is it that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah, absolutely. We have a, a, a group of uh, 30 PhDs working on biochemistry and uh, biotechnology to, to, to convert sugars, basically, uh, to, to chemicals. We have the partnership with Halder Topsoy on the MEG as well. Um, and, and, and that is uh, one of the most advanced uh, uh, projects we have, but we have others in the, in the pipeline looking at new polymers as well or new chemicals. Mm. Uh, so for sure, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Martin, Thanks. you're proving popular. Sorry, did I interrupt somebody there? Mm. No? Go on. Martin, you're proving popular in this panel. <laughs> um, Another question to you, are you looking at different sources for ethanol other than sugarcane? Right now, uh, we still see, even though we're using a crop uh, to make the, the pea, uh, it is still what, in, in, from our knowledge, is the most, re most resource efficient way of making the ethylene. 
uh, of course, we're looking at the new technologies that could convert CO2 to ethanol instead of going through the sugar cane. Uh, but uh, the, the, the resource efficiency of the sugarcane value chain is, is incredible. And if you compare it with, with corn, with the wheat and, and uh, sugar beet, it's, it's for sure the, the best alternative. So uh, we will only move from sugarcane if it is to second generation or third generation when it becomes uh, uh, more mainstream, more accessible and uh, cost competitive with sugarcane. Uh, so that's more or less it. Okay. Um, and then we have a question to all speakers here, uh, which is how much CO2 tax affects your green initiative profit profitability? And how high do you protect the C uh, to, do you predict the CO2 tax to be in 2030? That's a tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to go? Anyone want to run away? <laughs> well, the only thing I can comment is that in Brazil, we have a, um, a new program from the ethanol industry, or not, sorry, from the government that is uh, trying to foster biofuels. And therefore, uh, we do have a, a carbon credit scheme in Brazil for biofuels, where those with the best practices will have the most credits that they will manage to uh, collect from their biofuels and they will the end market is the fuel distributor that will have to buy credits to compensate the emissions from gasoline and diesel um, and and the the carbon credits are still rather very low value uh, I think especially if you convert to euros uh, but it is predicted to triple in value, and then it, it, this just started a few months ago, and it's predicted to triple in value in the next uh, year or so. Uh, and it is uh, something like uh, in euros, like thirty to fifty dollars per ton. So it's still low. I think it should be more, at least my feeling. I don't know. I may be wrong. Oh, bad. <laughs> Yeah. Anybody else wish to comment on that? Yeah, I, I mean, in terms of saying what the carbon price should be, um, you know, from Unilever's perspective, we're working on the high level commission in carbon price in the sense that, you know, we, we're very much looking at um, where to set that carbon price. But of course, it wouldn't be up to Unilever to decide what that should be. Um, you know, hope is that market mechanisms will, will exist that will drive carbon pricing that brings uh, company action in line with what is needed for uh, achieving the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, I would say, in addition, you know, we, we use the guidance that, that I just mentioned in our own internal carbon pricing, which we, which we use to help direct um, uh, resources towards sustainability initiatives that drive down the carbon footprint. Okay. Anybody else want to comment on that question? What I did, what I did learn uh, uh, from the CEO from Unilever in a presentation is that when developing a, pro, a new product, they look at the, the carbon footprint as a, a cost. So they put a cost to carbon footprint there to, to try to uh, avoid, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Julia, but try to, to direct to low carbon solutions, the, the new developments. Mm. Yeah, indeed. Okay. Um, question for Martin and Julia. What is the relationship of your companies with farmers? Um, it ends there it, and how, but, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you can imagine. I, I, I can start if, uh, if Julia wants some time to think about it. <laughs> Uh, we, uh, we have an a ethanol responsible uh, sourcing program and we of course don't have direct uh, relationship with farmers. We have direct re uh, relationship with ethanol producers which have their own land but also have relationship themselves with uh, farmers. So what we ask them is that they, the, the same kind of criteria we have to uh, evaluate the sustainability and responsibility of their uh, cultivation, they have it with their uh, third party suppliers. Uh, 
so uh, honestly speaking, we don't have this uh, direct re relationship with farmers, but we to, do try to impact uh, positively, positively the way they, um, the, our suppliers uh, ask them to treat uh, land, employers, deforestation, biodiversity, etc. cetera. Uh -huh. Julia? Yeah, and uh, just to build on that, you know, the, the Unilever supply chain is quite is quite big and, and the closeness or farness from farmers will vary depending on the material that we're talking about. Um, but in general, our, uh, we work with farmers through our suppliers, be they suppliers of ingredients or materials. Um, and we have been driving a sustainable agriculture program with them actually since the late 1990s uh, when it was an R&D program inside of the well, it was a sustainability program inside the R&D department and then became part of the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan in about 2011. So in that respect, we are, um, we, we basically can drive sustainable sourcing when we have visibility to the farm. Um, and that uh, in 2019, we achieved 62% sustainably sourced materials. Um, so so that, gives, that gives a sense, mm -hmm. even though, you know, we may not be sourcing directly from farmers, we do have the ability to influence their practices via Via our supply chain. Um, I think importantly though, you know, this needs to be very much about collective action because um, often from one farm we might buy one product but there's maybe three crops in rotation. Um, so it's really important to think about it holistically and in terms of various uh, other supply chain actors and their responsibility to the farmer as well, which I think speaks to the point of how to share in the added value. It's very much difficult to do that from a single dimension when one is impacting many, many different supply chains that may all come off of, off of a single farm. But it shows clearly this traceability for the supply chain is extremely important uh, for the future. Yeah. Um, Yuka, I think we're running close to the time slot now. Would you agree? Do you, yeah. do you want to conclude? Uh, we, we did have a couple more, but we, we're, we're getting stuck for time. I think. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And uh, all in all, we are collecting all these questions and we will share these, okay, at least together with the speakers. And maybe we can have a look at that. Okay, we do know the names who have been addressing the questions. So we do our best to come up with that, okay, the answers that, okay, what you addressed to us and the, the, our great speakers today. So all in all, I think it's okay. This was a okay, uh, great startup for this at the okay, round table. It mm -hmm. is the first as such. And I think I really liked it about it, okay, the panel discussion and okay, how it was all moderated. So big thanks to Ludo. And that maybe as we are always doing that, okay, maybe if you allow that, okay, a few questions also to you that, okay, that uh, you do know this sector very well, but was there anything new for you? Did you learn anything out of this? Maybe you can share your quick you all, I, I would like also to thank uh, the audience also, and especially the four panel members uh, for their great contributions. Uh, what I liked very much in the discussion was that we are not just uh, speaking about bio-based and the biomass as an origin, but we are speaking more and more about recycling this. And so bringing this in a sustainable circle I think a few years ago, it was a full separation of the technical circle, which was bad, and the, the bio circle was good, and there was no uh, in between. Mm. And then we had uh, tremendous discussions about availability of biomass, which was bad because there was not enough biomass uh, to, to replace it, etc. But if we can go to a gradual uh, change, it will be possible. And then we use these technical means, but with a feedstock slowly coming from the, uh, the, the biosphere. So, and that would be uh, perfectly uh, possible. And I really like that this was mentioned uh, in several ways in the different um, presentations as a, yeah. as a first point. I, I, I think a second one is that we see that the biorefinery is really get, making all uh, out of uh, biomass and not <clears throat> only uh, making pulp and paper or something that everything is used and we also see that we are on the move that also energy is um, not seen as something that is abundantly available uh, in a tree but that also there we can uh, make it more efficient in a way that we have more carbon left over for chemicals uh, etc. 
and maybe in the same point that this is something we did not uh, mention today, but that's for the next discussion. I think the more we move to bio, the more we need water in our processing. And uh, it was mentioned, uh, I think, uh, by, um, uh, by Joseph that, that, uh, um, that water, it was also mentioned by Michael, uh, water is an issue, of course, and uh, mm. going to processes that need less water is also extremely uh, uh, important. And finally, I think this traceability is uh, becoming extremely important uh, worldwide for all of our um, feedstocks. Mm. Okay, thanks, Luder. Okay, I don't have not that much to add on. Maybe to why I... <laughs> communication. Yeah. I think we um, we had uh, a nice discussion on these science and facts based arguments. Um, I can only fully agree with that, but we see also in the COVID discussion how difficult it is uh, to come with scientific arguments as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really still a lot of work uh, ahead for us all to move away from a lot of emotional discussions in, in this field uh, towards really scientific based and fact based uh, issues. And so um, we have to show that um, by going from this biotech uh, system, we can bring it in a technical cycle and, and that by doing so, we can still conserve biodiversity and, and so on. I think that's also a message that we have to take into account maybe for the, the next World Bioeconomy Forum next year as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much, Ludwig. Okay, and thanks for the speakers. And that okay, that uh, with the two minutes, I also to conclude that okay, what, what okay, the lessons that okay, what I did learn out of this this all, and that okay, that uh, very much that okay, what was hearing that okay, that uh, you were mentioned about joining the forces, the new marriage. So it seems to be that okay, trend is there in, uh, taking place that okay. The, the bio-based companies are going to that direction, which was normally then done by the, okay, the fossil-based companies and opposite. And uh, there is a good matchmaking opportunities to do to these, these uh, let's say, okay, big uh, industry sectors. So uh, and in a way that okay, like was on the that okay by by Mihail that okay that okay also okay there are okay uh, uh, let's say okay certain strengths that okay each party is like okay okay the forest industry is very good on this that, okay feedstock side that okay did you say that okay UPM is two, was it 20, 26 million cubic meters that you are then okay procuring every year and uh, that's quite quite a lot and you do that all in the okay, sustainable way and on the other hand that, okay having a look at another side of the value chain that okay what was very much said by Julia that okay about this that okay that the, what the patent okay the consumer choice and uh, seems to be that as was mentioned also by by Ludo, that this transparency is becoming a really, really a big issue. And it is one of the drivers for the consumers. And they would like to see through what is the end of that channel that, okay, where the, okay, the products are coming. And certainly it is quite challenging that you cannot put that like that, that, okay, there is the, okay, the system in place. It just takes time. But I think that, okay, that very much what was said, okay, mentioned by Julia, that, okay, you have a set quite ambitious targets and you are working on it that you are already good on that. So uh, yeah, that, that is what to get the good notion and also very much the okay, good, good insights from okay, the Martin and about this, okay, you were quite popular today and uh, okay, and uh, what I can say to you that okay, that we are coming closer to you that okay, is that okay, next word by the economy warm is it okay, not always here in Europe, not always in Finland, not always in Ruka, so uh, we are now looking forward to, okay, to having the next forum in Brazil. So we will come back to that still this year, where <laughs> it's going to be then, then held. And all in all, that, okay, this Josef, that, okay, you make a good points. You are already having this okay, recycling uh, within the textile value chain. It is a new issue, I would say, that uh, in comparison, like okay, the pulp and paper industry, they are already hovering in the level of 70 percent is that okay, based on the recycled fibers, whereas the textile is not yet there. But okay, I think that okay, that is going to that 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 direction. So uh, I think we all learn a lot. I think that okay, we are about ending up this round table, and uh, I would like you to then okay, stay tuned. We are already planning the next round table which will take place in the beginning of February 
in the beginning of February, actually 3rd of February, and it will be uh, about the the theme of the, uh, the bioeconomy, people, planet and policies, and uh, that uh, roundtable will be uh, moderated by um, uh, Christian Paterman, he is known as the godfather in the Tokyo EU bioeconomy, I think okay, quite many of you do know him, and so uh, please join us also on that point of time. So. We'll stop here and um, Christmas is okay only one month ago. I wish you a Merry Christmas and even better New Year to come. So with these words and uh, within this okay video, have a good evening for to all of you. Yes. Thank you.